So hello everybody, my name is Alexander Schleich and I'm a group leader at the Institute for Computational Physics and I welcome you from my side to the Virtual Espresso Summer School 2020. And what I want to talk to you today about is the, an introduction to the charged soft matter. So let me start with the question, what actually is soft condensed matter? So condensed matter refers to matter that is not in the gas phase, but it is condensed as a liquid or solid. This means that intermolecular energies are comparable to the thermal, uh, which is the kinetic energy. So it's all comparable to KT. Let me give you two particular examples. So for water at room temperature, you are obviously in a liquid phase at ambient pressures of about one bar. However, by changing the pressure or the temperature, you can easily tune from the vapor phase into a solid phase. A very different picture emerges, for example, for CO2, which at ambient conditions is a gas. However, by changing temperature and pressure, you can also tune it into a liquid or even a solid phase. So why do we term it soft matter? So the reason is simply that it shows both the characteristics of solids and liquids. And actually the term soft matter was coined by Dijen in 1991 when giving his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. So liquid properties means it has a measurable viscosity. Whereas uh, typical for a uh, soft matter as condensed material is the property of an elastic deformation. So the soft matter shows a viscoelastic behavior. Here I show you a broad range of example for soft materials, soft matter materials. So ranging from rubbers, gels like your toothpaste, you can have a typical ser, which shows both uh, uh, the typical viscoelastic behavior. You can have foams, and this is a very famous German example of uh, beer foam, colloidal crystals. Uh, but you can also range into a whole range of biology, like proteins or all the intracellular uh, uh, domain. And here is an example that is actually taken from a simulation, which is the flow of blood cells, which also reveals a broad range of viscoelastic behavior. Let's have a look at typical length scales emerging. So here I show you the full length scale ranging from a femtometer, where you have protons or electrons to the size of a universe. And actually soft matter concerns the range ranging from about a nanometer to a few micrometers. So several examples were covering these length scales. So on the smaller scales, from the biological side, we have uh, molecules like DNA or um, uh, methane. Whereas then going to longer scales, I show you here an actin filament network or magnetic particles interacting with each others that are on the length scale of a few nanometers. So going larger in size, we have bacterial uh, phages or colloidal crystals. And then on a micrometer length scales, you have cells or you can tune the interaction between colloidal particles to form such well-defined uh, structures. And even going larger, you have, for example, blood cells or human hair. And what I show here is an example of a hydrogel that swells to really macroscopic droplets that you can observe with your eye. So what is the origin of surface charges? Uh, at the surface of any material, you can have dissociation or ionization of surface groups. Here I show you some prominent examples that lead to positive or negative surface charges. Uh, and when they come into contact with water, they dissociate the surface charge or protons get absorbed into the surface and leading to an effective net charge. You can also have preferential absorption of judged species at the surface. So typically at uh, silver iodide surfaces, you have an agglomeration of positive charges Whereas, for example, at gold surfaces, you have an accumulation of negatively charged uh, ions. So these surface charges are actually the driving force for colloidal stability and self-organization. 
when you have a colloidal solution, depending on your interactions and the molecular details, you can have creaming, sedimentation, flocculation, or coalescence. And the electrostatic interactions together with the steric repulsion actually lead to a well-defined stability in such uh, colloidal suspensions. So polyelectrolytes are a very special kind of soft material. We are talking about charged macromolecules which dissociate charges in solution. So very importantly, this means that they are water soluble. One synthetic example I show you here, it's polyacrylic acid, or another example would be sulfonated polystyrene. And such mater synthetic materials are used, as already mentioned, as super absorbers or to modify viscosity of any so some solutions. You can have additives to detergents. They are used for paper industry and waste management. On the biological side, however, we are talking about cell membranes, DNA, RNA, or proteins. And obviously these examples are useful for gene transfer and especially it is important to understand their biological functions, you know, like for example, the DNA packing. Commonly, these uh, polyelectrolytes have a large tendency to self-assemble in nanostructures. In general, it is not necessary to treat all the electrostatic interactions between all partial charges in the system. That's why we treat water implicitly via a dielectric background of the relative permittivity epsilon r. So for a simplification, we assume point charges only that have a valency C and all other interactions except the electroesthetic ones are neglected. So what we have to do to solve the ion distribution, like I show here, for example, for the salt confined between two charged surfaces is to minimize the Gibbs free energy, which consists in general of two contributions. The one are electrostatic interactions, which the, with the typical Coulomb law, and the other one is the ideal gas free energy. So in very general, this poses a hard problem and cannot be solved. However, there are some limiting cases and one I would like to present to you here, which is the mean field approach, which means that each charge only feels the mean potential of all other charges. So by minimizing this free energy, you get actually the Boltzmann distribution of the ions in their mean potential. So how do we now treat actually a suspension of such colloidal particles? The answer is by making an iterative approximation going from the solution to the ion distribution around single molecules. So you typically divide your system in smaller uh, unit cells and then assign a, a, a cell model to each charged macro ion and then solve in detail the ion distribution by factorization of the many party partition function into the product of one particle partition functions. Using the mean potential and the Boltzmann distribution, we can actually plug this into Poisson's equation, which is the Laplace operator acting on the charge distribution. Considering that we have positive and negative ions in the salt solution, and additionally, a fixed charge distribution, which is due to the surface charge on the macromolecules. General things to consider when applying the Poisson Boltzmann equation is that we have point like ions, so we do not have any excluded volume effects, and we treat everything in mean field, so we do not have any correlation between charges. And importantly, this typically fails if your valency of your uh, salt is larger than one. So the Poisson Boltzmann equation presents a second order partial differential equation, and correspondingly, Closed solutions are only accessible, available for a few simple geometries like planar walls or cylinders. You can have, of course, many extensions to include finite sized ions, dielectric effects, or corrections to include correlation effects. If we assume that we have a 1 1 electrolyte, which means that we have a valency of plus and minus 1 only, like for example for sodium chloride, and we express the potential in reduced units of thermal energy, then we can actually simplify this expression to the famous Sinch expression, 
where we introduced the uh, inverse squared screening length that I will explain you on the next slide. So the idea behind this screening length is that uh, we can perform a linearization of this Pasa Boltzmann equation in the case where the potential is small compared to the thermal energy. And in this case, you see that the solution of the linearized Pasa Boltzmann equation is actually given by a screened solution with a characteristic screening length termed the Debye length, which is given by this expression here. This importantly, due to this exponential screening, the Debye screening length corresponds to the characteristic length scale of the electrostatic interactions in the salt. As you can see from the equation, the dependence on the salt concentration is one over square root of concentration, which yields about three angstrom for a one molar sodium chloride solution in water. At physiological conditions of about 100 millimole, this corresponds already to a nanometer. And if you have pure water, you get something like a micrometer where all electrostatic interactions are screened due to the auto-ionization of water. Importantly, there's another length scale to consider when looking at electrostatic interactions. This so-called Bierum length asks the question, when is actually the electrostatic energy equal to the thermal energy? And by solving this for the Bierum length, you obtain this expression and plugging in the numbers for water at room temperature, which is uh, has a relative dielectric constant of about 80, you see actually that you have seven angstroms of Bjarum length. Contrary, if you look at vacuum, then you see that electrostatic interactions, they are equal to thermal energy on a length of about 55 nanometers. So this Bjarum length actually allows us to rewrite the electrostatic energy in a very compact way where you have the energy in units of thermal energy, it's just given by the Bjerung length times the product of the charges interacting divided by the distance. How good actually is the description of the water as an implicit solvent? So what I show you here is a simulation result for the pair energy between the sodium and the chloride ion interacting in an aqueous solution. So what we used here is a thousand SPC water molecules and SPC water using these simulation parameters has dielectric constant of 72, which is reasonably close to the experimental value. When we compare now the electrostatic interaction between all ions in the simulation with the theoretical prediction, you see that at reasonably large length scales, both nanometer, you have an excellent agreement. However, when you get closer, the atomistic structure of water solvation shell uh, becomes into play and you get very pronounced uh, oscillations in the pair interaction energy. Nonetheless, the shape of these oscillations is well captured up to small distances using this implicit water description. Let's look at the solution of the possible Boltzmann equation for a semi-infinite charged plate. Let's now look at the situation where we have an ionic solution, a salt, in front of a semi-infinite charged plane. This actually was first considered by independently by Guy and Chapman more than 100 years ago. So in this case, we can simplify the Poisson-Boltzmann equation to a 1D equation and applying the boundary conditions for the surface charge at zero and the vanishing electric field at infinity, we can easily solve this Foster Boltzmann equation for the counter ion only case. So, in this case, you only have negative ions that compensate the positive charge of the surface. Importantly, what Gui and Chapman realized is that this defines another length scale which is important to consider in Pasa-Boltzmann theory, the so-called Guy-Chapman length. The Guy-Chapman length 
is the length at which the electrostatic interaction of ions with a charged surface decays to 1 over E. Plugging this solution of the Posse Boltzmann equation into the ion density, you can integrate this and directly obtain the ion distribution at as a function of the distance from the surface. Importantly, one can easily show that half of the counter ions are localized within a thin layer of the Guy Chapman length. And this strong ion localization actually motivated Stern to model this as an adsorbed layer of ions to better describe surface capacitance measurements, which actually later was refined by Graham and many others. Let's have a look at the linearization of Guy Chapman theory. In this case, the potential is simply given by an exponential and the corresponding ion distribution then is also exponential. And what you see in this figure and also from looking at the equations is that you have an exponential rather than an algebraic decay. The resulting contact density is overestimated by a factor 2 independent of the surface charge density. Thus the linearized Posse Boltzmann theory in the salt-free case fails already at arbitrarily small values of the surface charge density. Let's look at driving force for coil stability. And the first ones to analyze this in detail were Diogen, Landau, Fewe and Overbeck in the 1940s. And they realized that actually this is due to an interplay of screened electrostatic interactions, the so-called Yukawa potential, which for large colloidal particles of size A reads like this, where kappa is the screening length introduced previously. The attractive interactions result from van der Waals forces, which for small molecular particles typically scale like 1 over r to the 6. However, for large colloidal particles, it can be approximated using the radius of the colloidal particles and the Hamaker constant and the then you have see that you have a long range 1 over r inter attraction in this case. The resulting net interaction is repulsive on large length scales and then diverges as 1 over r on the small length scales. That's why in simulations you typically include a short range in repulsion to model the Pauli exclusion principle. This results in the famous Leonard Jones or Buckingham potentials. So let's come back to the problem of pull electrolyte modeling. So when modeling a pull electrolyte in a salt solution, in general you have to do it with a very complex interaction because the ion distribution is directly coupled to polymer conformations. To make a simplification valid for stiff and stretched polymer conformations, we model a pull electrolyte in the following as a uniformly charged rod. So we again set up a minimal cell model consisting of charges on an radial axis and the cylinder as a width of capital R. These line charges are separated by, at the, by a characteristic distance B such that the corresponding line charge density reads as E over B. In this one-dimensional system actually the electrostatic potential is proportional to the logarithm of the radial coordinate. What we are interested in now is if it is and uh, favorable for the ions to condense onto this line charge density or to stay somewhere in this cell volume. And we followed Onsager's uh, condensation argument uh, where he considered the free energy change bringing the ion from somewhere in this volume to a certain distance r on, at the line charge. And according to this, the free energy uh, consists of both an energetic and a contrib uh, entropic contribution, where the energetic contribution is just given by the uh, ratio of the electrostatic potentials. So it's the logarithmic ratio of the two radii. And the entropic contribution is simply proportional to the two accessible volumes for the ions. So it also scales as this logarithmic ratio. Putting in all these numbers, you, we see that this is the free energy change and the important 
parameter for this condensation to happen if, if this prefactor is positive or negative, because it determines if ions will condense onto this line charge or not. So if this ratio here, the so-called Manning parameter, is actually smaller than one, then the resulting free energy will be negative, meaning that the ions favorably condense onto this line charge, whereas if it is larger than one, then the system uh, actually prefers to have the ions somewhere in the cell model. You see also that uh, this uh, ion condensation argument only makes sense in a cylindrical symmetry, because if you have a charged plane, then uh, the uh, volume ratios always favor an energy dominated case, meaning that you have no condensation, whereas in the charged sphere, you have an entropy dominated system, meaning that you will always condense onto the sphere surface. With this, we are now able to actually write down the Professor Boltzmann equation in this cylindrical cell model of a given line charge density lambda, and the charge rod has a certain radius r0. We write down again the Pierrot length and the Manning parameter, and we again introduce the reduced electrostatic potential. Then the uh, Professor Boltzmann equation in these units reads as this, and the corresponding a charge distribution is for, just follows from the electrostatic potential. The boundary conditions are given by the line charge density at the cylinder boundary and by the vanishing electrostatic uh, field at the cell boundary. The solution of the Professor Boltzmann equation then can be calculated as follows, which you can easily check by inserting into the Professor Boltzmann equation. And these integration constants then actually are, have to be determined based on the corresponding boundary conditions. Having assessed the solution of the Professor Boltzmann equation, we can now integrate the ion distribution function to obtain the fraction of ions at a certain distance r. And we know actually that from in a Manning condensation picture for Manning parameters larger than one, we expect the ions to be condensed. However, in the Professor Boltzmann solution, the fraction of condensed ions is uh, finite even if we send the cell model to infinity. That's why to map this to an effective two-state model, we introduce an inflection point criterion where we actually say that the um, fraction that ions condense if there's an inflection point at the so-called Manning radius and then the corresponding fraction of condensed ions corresponds exactly to this Manning parameter. Now let's, let's briefly discuss the case when we don't have only counter ions in the system, but where we have added salt in the solution. What happens is actually that the inflection points shift corresponding to the salt, uh, salt concentration, and we have to translate the ion fraction into a charge fraction. The more salt we have, we, the more screening we have. And thus the condensed layer contracts, as you can see in this picture here. Looking at the inflection point criterion, you see that for given uh, screening length, new inflection points appear, and this corresponds to a certain range where you have condensation. If uh, the Debye screening is smaller than the radius of the cell model, then you have these new uh, inflection points appearing, whereas if you get smaller than this um, uh, Manning radius that we calculated previously, you will not observe any uh, inflection points anymore because then actually the electrostatic screen due to the, the uh, Professor Boltzmann solution dominates. So what we observe if we have added salt is an exchange of the relevant length scale where we replace the Manning radius with the Debye length. And if screening dominates, the concept of condensation actually loses its meaning. Finally, let's come to the question how we can simulate such a system in a computer. So what we have to do is we set up a geometry with this hex uh, cylindrical rod and to actually make optimal use of the volume to surface ratio, we use a hexagonal simulation cell and employ periodic boundary conditions to make this rod infinite. To treat the electrostatics, we use the P3M algorithm and the interaction between the ions cannot be point-like because if particles would overlap, then we would have infinite energies. That's why we 
replace the point-like ions by finite sized ions using either hardcore potential or a typical Leonard Jones potential here. To have the system coupled to a solvent at a certain temperature, we use a Lajava thermostat, which does nothing else than add the noise that is corresponding, uh, chosen correspondingly, such that it has a certain friction uh, and we get the right diffusion constant of the ions. Let's now compare the simulation results to the predictions of Pastor Boltzmann theory. And again, I remind you that the Pastor Boltzmann theory fixes only the universal ratio of the Manning parameter times the valency. In general, we observe that the Pastor Boltzmann theory uh, is, uh, predicts less condensation than compared to the simulations. And we see that this product of the Manning parameter times the valency is no longer universal. Actually, the discrepancy increases with the ion valence. What we show in yellow here actually is a local density approximation, which is a correction to the Pastor Boltzmann free energy functional and kind of includes correlation effects. What we see is that the Pastor Boltzmann theory neglects correlations. And these enhance actually counter ion condensation, especially for multivalent ions. Let us last take one closer look at what happens if we have now multivalent salt. To this, we consider a 2 2 salt and a rather high density. And what we see from the simulations compared to the possible theory is that the rod charge gets repeatedly overcompensated and we see the establishment of reverse charge layers. These charged oscillations are damped exponentially. Summarizing one last time, I want to highlight that Pastor Boltzmann fails generally if uh, electrostatic interactions are strong, which means you have high surface or line charge densities. If you have multivalent ions, such that you cannot neglect correlation effects, or if you have a high density of ions, such that well excluded volume effects become important. Now let's slightly switch topic and look at electrophoresis. Electrophoresis refers to the case when you have an ion in a salt solution, uh, which can be any macromolecule or colloidal particle, or even larger molecules that are charged, and you apply an electric field such that the electrostatic force uh, wants to pull this charged macro object with it. Counteracting this force, you have a friction force and the electrostatic retardation force due to the ion cloud. The application of such an electrophoresis is, for example, the biomolecule separation, like in gel electrophoresis or capillary electrophoresis, but it's also importantly used in particle characterization to determine the mobility and via this the zeta potential to get the actual charge of these particles. So what determines the force balance here? It's actually a competition between the electrostatic driving force, which simply is proportional to the charge and the electrostatic field, the friction force, which on the limit of Stokes' law is just given by the size of the particle, uh, the viscosity of the solvent and the uh, velocity V, and the retardation force is actually electrostatic force acting on the counter ion cloud and this deformation of the diffused air actually leads to an additional viscous stress on the charged macromolecule. And the force balance actually results in a uh, effective electroosmotic mobility, which is the particle velocity divided by the electrostatic field. And Smoluchowski actually was the first one who derived a theory for sufficiently small, sufficiently thin Debye layers, which means it's a small screening length. And in this theory, actually, the uh, electrophoretic mobility is given by the ratio of the zeta potential and the viscosity of the solvent. So the zeta potential is the electrostatic potential at the slipping plane. Let's have a look at this charged macromolecule. So you see you have this layer of strongly condensed ions that we previously discussed in the beginning of lecture. And then you have this double layer distribution of the ions and the zeta potential actually really refers to the uh, poten electrostatic potential at the slipping plane, which is really the plane where the effective hydrodynamic radius uh, 
of the particle is. And in general, uh, this uh, zeta potential depends on the colloid radius A and the screening length kappa via the Henry function, where the Henry function actually can take values between 1 and 1 1.5. So to measure this uh, electrophoretic mobility in simulations efficiently, it is actually uh, clever to make use of linear response theory. Linear response theory applies if we consider a system with a time-dependent perturbed Hamiltonian. So we have the Hamiltonian with this perturbation and the perturbation is given by this simple periodic function here. And then A actually is the conjugated quantity which just converts the right-hand side here to an energy. Within linear response theory, now the change of any observable B uh, due to the perturbation can uh, follows uh, by looking at this uh, coefficient, which is then perturbed. And this coefficient actually is given by the observable and the time der der derivative of the conjugated quantity. And what you see here is that we get the frequency dependent response function. In other words, a single simulation in the linear regime is enough to get the full frequency spectrum of this response function. Let's make this a bit more clear looking at a specific example. So we consider now molecules in a planar confinement, so which means that they are between two infinite uh, walls and the perturbation field now actually really mimics a force acting on the x direction uh, on the particle positions. Then it follows that the conjugated quantity actually is the particle position such that its time derivative just is the particle velocities. Plugging this in, we get the uh, time dependent uh, response function where we see we have the correlation function between the summed uh, velocities. Often in such problems, one is only interested in the time independent case where the driving force, which is typically is a gradient in the chemical potential, is time independent. Taking the limit of the frequency to zero, we obtain the classical green Kubo formula for the collective diffusion coefficient by plugging this into Fick's law, where we have the transport, the flux, which is given just by the collective diffusion coefficient and the chemical potential gradient. And then by just integrating this uh, velocity correlation function to a long time limit, we obtain the corresponding value of the diffusion coefficient. Now, a bit of care has to be taken in the simulations because of statistical noise at this limit uh, when taking the time to infinity, you get more and more noise. That's why typically you look for plateau in the integral and take the corresponding value from this plateau. Now this was just one example of many possible green cube relations. Further examples range from the self-diffusion coefficient where you have the correlation function between individual particle velocities, the shear viscosity where you have the correlation function between the uh, off-diagonal components of the pressure tensor, for the thermal conductivity, you need to calculate the thermal flux correlation function, the friction coefficient, which is the, the friction of a fluid acting on a wall, uh, is given actually by looking at the forces which this fluid uh, exerts on the wall. You can calculate the electrical conductivity by just uh, uh, calculating the correlation functions between the electric currents in a certain direction which actually also is very important to get directly the frequency dependent electrical conductivity. And of course, uh, one is interested in the electrophoretic mobility. Here one has to be, take a bit care because actually this involves a mixed correlation between the test particle and all other particles. With this, let me come to some final conclusions. I hope I showed you that soft matter is an interdisciplinary field of research affecting many aspects of our everyday life. And electrostatic repulsive forces ensure the colloidal stability at well-defined separations, which is important both for technology and biology.
what you should take as uh, take home messages from this uh, lecture is that the Poisson Boltzmann uh, equation, which employs a mean field approximation, and how to linearize it using the Bayhuckel theory. And that actually there are many competing length scales in such problems. The OVO theory, which actually includes an attractive contribution to get well defined separations. You should have learned the principles of electrophoresis and how linear response theory and Green Kuber relations can be applied for, to obtain the frequency dependent response functions from molecular simulations. And finally, I hope that you agree that statistical mechanics and computer simulations team up as a powerful tool for soft matter science. Thank you for your attention.